I read the, the additional text because they so correspond with the first reading, the book of Acts. And so I want to I want to begin with the book of Acts. It's called the book of Acts, but as I said last week, it should have been called the book of the Holy Spirit. Now, I also learned in the seminary that we Lutherans are not good about talking about the Holy Spirit. He's kind of like a poor cousin. He's there, but we really don't talk about him much. We're very Christ-centered. We, we have a great Christology, Christology, ology, word of Christ. So we're strong in that second uh, creedal statement, but not so much on the third. And I, I wonder why is that? Why are we so, so shy in talking about the Holy Spirit? Why do we leave it up to the Pentecostals, for instance? I don't know why. So the book of Acts is very much spirit-filled. And so... Paul is led by the Spirit, and I'll read it to you. They went through the region of Phrygia and Gal Gal uh, Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak a word in Asia. So now the Holy Spirit is directing Paul and Barnabas and Timothy into Europe, into Macedonia. Now, do you remember, and this is a question for, 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 uh, for our historians, and I point to Jeremy, there is a great man who came from Macedonia about three centuries before Christ. Can you recall his name? Anyone? Dale? Alexander. Alexander the Great, who conquered not only Macedonia and consolidated, but spread his armies across Asia and Europe. Alexander the Great. Macedonia. And Macedonia is a tough place to evangelize. Paul and, Paul and Barnabas are going to figure that one out real fast. Uh, but interestingly enough, Alexander the Great built his empire by force, by arms, by violence. These three men are going to build something totally different. Not an empire, but they're going to be speaking the words of a new kingdom, a new Jerusalem. And they're going to be messengers of peace and persuasion, and inspiration as people listen to the word of God and their hearts will be opened. And so now we'll have our first conversion experience here, and her name is Lydia. So it says, they went through Phrygia and Galatia, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak a word in Asia, and when they had come upon Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them either to go there. So passing by, they went to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision. Remember last week, Peter had a vision of Cornelius. Well, he had a vision of God talking to him, saying, do not call unholy what I will make holy. Go to Cornelius and baptize these gentle folks, these Gentile folks. So now, Paul is out in the mission field, and he sees a vision. And it's a man who says to go to Macedonia. Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, it says, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God has called us to proclaim the good news to them. So they're going into foreign territory, not knowing a soul, into a land that 
as they would consider to be less civilized than they had known. Now, talk about taking a risk. Taking a risk because they felt called by a Holy Spirit. Wow. So, they set sail for Troas, and they came straight upon Sam Samothrace. I wish I could speak Greek a little bit better. The following day to Neapolis and there to Philippi. And we have a letter from Paul to the Philippians. This is the church that there's going to start there. And so they went into Macedonia, which was a Roman colony. So it was a part of the West. And we, we remained in this city for some five, five days. So can you imagine? Here they are. They have just gone into foreign territory, into Macedonia, because Paul saw a man say, go to Macedonia. So there they go. They go into the city. And now they're waiting for five days. What are they doing for five days? Waiting for the Holy Spirit to say something? Probably. But in the meantime, what do you do in a foreign country, in a foreign city, where you don't speak the language, although Greek is helpful? Well, I suppose they were playing Scrabble for a while, maybe gin rummy, just to pass the time. I don't know, but five days occurs. And so then, on the Sabbath, they went outside the gate by the river, where we suppose that there was a place of prayer, and it's true, there was a place of prayer, a synagogue. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. Just a second. I'm getting, I'm getting to the point where... Oh, that... Oh, I can see. Oh, this isn't what I thought at all. So I'm going to change subjects here. And a certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us, and she was from the city of Thuria, and she was a dealer in purple cloth. Now, it's significant that Luke, Luke is the author of Acts, book of Luke and Acts, he gives her a name. She must be prominent. She must have been a very prominent citizen for him to give, write her name into, the accord, into, this, into this document. And it says that she was a cloth dealer of purple. That's significant. Purple was a color of royalty, of wealth. And so she must have been a prominent citizen making cloth, clothing, for very wealthy people. So she was associated with the upper echelons of that society. And she had a business there, which gives Paul and his companions so, some legitimacy here. So that it says, when she and her household were baptized, the, it says the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what Paul said. Her heart was opened. We always say, you know, we need to keep an open mind to different things, right? But here, it's an open heart that the message of God is not going to come through an intellectual treatise or a certain dogma or doctrine. It's going to be from the heart, from heart to heart, which means that Paul and his folks are going to be telling them about a resurrected Jesus and all of the stories that go with Jesus that will open her heart to accept the word of God. Now why? How does that happen? How does the Holy Spirit open the heart? Whereas others are closed to the word, hers is open to this very, very new thing. She was, but she was almost ready for it. She was, you could almost say she was praying for something to come. Something new. Something that would would, it would capture her. And she accepted their word. And then, not only did she open her heart, she opened her home to them so that they could stay with her. Thus taking herself a great risk. 
because then she's responsible for these foreigners, whoever they were. But her household and she were baptized, the first baptisms in the book of Acts, I believe, were not the first woman baptized in the book of Acts. What opens our hearts? What is it that will inspire us? What is it that leads us? And how do we know? How do we know it's the Holy Spirit that's leading us? I was watching a uh, documentary the other day about Philip Glass. Now, do you know who Philip Glass is? A very, a very influential music composer. And uh, back in the late 60s, he and other artists said, you know, all of this music theory and all of what we've learned before, we're just throwing it out. We're going to create something totally new. And they did. This is the late 60s. And so, so they got a band together and they started playing this, this music. And most people who heard it said, that isn't music. That isn't what we know. That is totally foreign to us. But some understood it and appreciated it. And, they, and, and, and as more and more people began to understand it and to appreciate it in its, in its newness, other, other avenues, other artistic impulses sprang from that. And so I asked Becky today, do you know Philip Glass? And she said, of course, we had to study him. Can you play something for us? Uh, no. <laughs> because it's so avant-garde, I think it's, it's, very, it's, it's very unusual. Can we say that, I guess? But they asked him, where do you get your inspiration? He said, I don't know. It's, 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 like, it's like I'm listening to an underground river. I, I can hear it. I know it's there. I don't know where it's coming from, and I don't know where it's going, but I can hear it. I, can, I listen to it, and I, and I take notice of it, and I take notes from it. I hear the music, and I write it down. It doesn't come from up here. It comes from here, and it comes from here. You just have to know, and it's not easy. And Sometimes I can't hear it myself. But when I hear it, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to use my words here, plugged in into something much greater than myself. And I'm just recording what's already there. I believe the Holy Spirit acts like that, like that in our lives, too. It's like an underground river that when you take the time and the patience to hear it, to listen to it, we can be moved. We can be inspired to perhaps do something, to do something new. Sometimes I, I hear it in myself. When I'm praying to God, which direction should I go? And I don't know where. I have to pray. I have to be quiet. I have to listen to what's going on in here. And usually I will feel that pull towards something. And sometimes I don't like where I'm being pulled to. I don't like, I would rather, there's an easier, softer way that I would rather go down that path. But somehow the Holy Spirit is, is moving me into a different direction. Pastors often feel this way when we're serving a congregation and there will be a movement, a small one at first, a very small one. But then it, it, you listen to it and, it, and it starts to gain a little bit of current. And then you begin to realize that the Holy Spirit is saying, it's time for you to move on. Your work is done here. I'm not saying that's happening to me now. <laughs> I've only been here six months. I've got another couple months, and then, you know, forget it. But, but it, it, it gains in strength. People will ask me, how did you feel called to the ministry? And it wasn't this, boom, boy, there it is. The Jew Jerusalem just dropped on my head, and there it was, and God just 
gave me a blueprint of my future, and I looked on it, and I said, okay, I need to go there, I need to go there, I need to go there. It doesn't happen that way. None of our lives go like that. Don't you wish that God could fax you down a blueprint of, of what he wants you, you to do in the next day, week, months ahead? I could be much more efficient to God if he would just tell me what he wants, but instead, as Woody Allen says, he likes to play hide and seek. But, is, but he's not hiding. He's there. He's, he's, in, he's in that current that, that, that sometimes I'm, we're plugged into, sometimes not. We're too busy. Sometimes I hear the Holy Spirit, not in here, but in here, from you, from, from a Bible study. Someone will say something, and it will light up something. And I think, oh, that's, that's where I should be going, or that's where we should be going. You know, people have asked me, well, what's your, Brian, what's your vision for St. John's Lutheran Church? And I say, I don't have one yet. Because the vision isn't going to be mine, and it's not going to be ours. It's going to be the Holy Spirit's vision for us. As the Holy Spirit will reveal this vision to us. And we might have to wait like Paul and Barnabas for a few days. It's going to come, perhaps slowly, perhaps quickly, but we, we, we move where we believe the Spirit leads us. And again, that ain't easy. So what I do is I try to pray to God, and I try this, I'm not always successful. I do it a couple of times to get into a discipline of this. Lord, open my heart to be led by your Holy Spirit. And let our church be an open place so that our hearts are open and so is our church to those who come. And may we all be sent forward in, into the world where the Holy Spirit leads us to go. Now, are we always going to be right? No. I have a friend, a uh, significant, significant social ministry. Terry was there. Laura was there in Chicago. Jerry was. And their motto is, fail fast, fail forward. Because they try a lot of different things. Some things worked. Others did not. Okay, we learn from that but they felt moved, they felt compelled, they felt drawn, they felt led to provide a ministry to the children in their community. And now, from a congregation of about 100 people, and believe me, 30 years ago, they were about ready to close their doors because they were so small. But somehow, the Holy Spirit spoke to them, and now they have... I don't know how many ministries in a budget of three to four million dollars in 30 years. I said it didn't happen overnight. I said, whoa, darn it. I was hoping we could come down here and then do and then boom and then ah, oh, here we are. No, it takes time. It takes listening to that underground river speak to us. And to always ask God to open our hearts to what you want us to do. To open ourselves to the new things God might be providing to us. The new things. To take the risks. To go forward. Lydia and her house, household were baptized into the Spirit. We have been baptized into the Spirit. So let us now, in this season of Pentecost, be led by the Spirit to open our hearts, our minds, our church to the world, and let us put together this vision that God has created for us. Amen.